Now, uh, you were intrigued by an article you read because you love history and you love literature. I love our classics. Next is about uh, that. Oh, good. So yes. tell me a little bit about this, the, why you're so interested well, in this article about Virgil. <laughs> All right. I try to read America Magazine yeah. every week, which is yeah. the Jesuit Weekly published here in New York, so I'm proud of it. And there was a great article. That, first of all, I saw Virgil. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't see much about Virgil, no. okay? And he, those of us, uh, you know, Arm of a Room Quaicano, right? Arm of a Room Quaicano. Remember that? His mercy endures forever. <laughs> <laughs> How could you get ordained <laughs> without get ordained? knowing the opening line of Virgil's Aeneid? All right, there Wait till he comes on. I know, anyway, <laughs> he was talking about Virgil, who we labored through senior year of high school. Right. Virgil's Aeneid, right. one of the greatest classics of mm -hmm. all time. Mm -hmm. And here I say, oh my gosh, what, what would there be an article on Virgil in here? And he gave a humdinger of an article about how almost Virgil, who obviously antedated Christ, right. had a Christian disposition. Yeah. And almost an Advent disposition. Oh, nice. So I said to Joe Zwilling and Liz, let's get this guy. He's a, he's a, uh, he teaches at Regis High School, a Jesuit high school here in town. And I said, see if we can get him on the show. So did you get him? Yeah, we got him. Yippee. I'm maybe, glad. Maybe because I went to a high school with Maris Brothers. Maybe I should have done the Jesuits and I would have read more of the Aeneid. Maybe you would have done some <laughs> of the Aeneid. Have you read it in English? Sure, in English, not in Latin. Okay. <laughs> It's one of the classics. See, I went to high school in the 80s. They actually didn't even offer Latin at the high school. I'd take French. Wow. I know. <laughs> at, at a Catholic high school. And then I went back to public school, and they offered Latin. So I, 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 I prepped myself. I know. go to public school I to get Latin. Myself. So when we return, David Bonagura, he is a teacher here at Regis High School, and his article most recently in America Magazine about Virgil was Virgil Catholic. When we return here on Conversation with Cardinal Dolan on the Catholic Channel, Sirius XM 129. <laughs> On this Advent edition of Conversation with Cardinal Dolan, we are joined here in our studios by David Fonagura. He teaches classical languages at St. Joseph's Seminary here in Yonkers for the Archdiocese of New York and high school students just up the street at the Jesuit High School, Regis High School. Welcome to Conversation with Cardinal Thank Dolan. Thank you, Father David. Let's be here. I'm glad you're here, Thank Thanks you. for coming on. You know the genesis of this. I was so impressed by your article in a, uh, America Magazine, Was Virgil Catholic? I got it here, that I said, we got to get this guy on the show. You were, I, I've been fascinated with Virgil since I was, since I studied him as a senior in high school at St. Louis Preparatory Seminary in, in the Archdiocese of, uh, of St. Louis. But the last thing I would have thought of, of him was a, a Catholic, and you kind of tease about that and hint about it. Yeah, I always knew when, when we talk about Western civilization, even when you talk about maybe Christendom, you would look to Virgil as one of the pillars. In fact, there was... Was it Hack, uh, Hacker who wrote the Virgil Father of the West, right? That's correct. That was sort of a classic that everybody would use to see how Virgil was the foundation of Western civilization. Never would I thought of him as a Catholic. Mm. I mean, it was chronologically impossible since he antedated Christ. But with David's excellent article, I thought, wow, Virgil has Catholic themes. Virgil has uh, hints of Catholicism. Explain that, David. There's lots of good uh, little Catholic tidbits you can pull out, but you take the first point that and Aeneas is often compared to Odysseus because there's lots of echoes of the Odyssey intentionally in the Aeneid. But uh, Theodore Hager says in his book, Virgil Father of the West, that Aeneas is really more like Abraham. He's called by this vo this inscrutable fatum, this voice that he is gods. He doesn't know what he's never seen them, and he's called to go to this land he's never been to, Italy in Aeneas's case. And he's just supposed to, you know, and this is, he's in exile. Uh, so just just drops everything and goes. And you know, along the way, all sorts of adventures uh, that are you know worth re warfare, romance. Also, it's just a great story, number one. But you have that uh, that Catholic overtone with. Here you have this guy obeying just on faith, following the gods, and then you have Jupiter, who you know in some ways can be seen as divine providence, directing Aeneas. Said, this is your destiny. This is where you're supposed to go. And Aeneas, of uh, you know, fulfills his duty. He obeys God, the, the will of the gods. And uh, in his case, we would say obey the will of God mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. Pietas, mm -hmm. which for the Romans was loyalty, duty to the gods, and towards one country. When we think of Christian pietas, we then think more of prayer, say to St. Francis, mm -hmm. uh, right. with, by the birds. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, for Aeneas, he's, his pietas is what we would say is following the will of God, being attentive and listening. I have heard, see, tell me if you agree with this, uh, David Bonagora here, a professor of classics at Regis High School, the Jesuit High School, the acclaimed Jesuit High School here in New York, that probably the two of the most n normative books in Western civilization would be Virgil's Aeneid and 
Dante's. Uh, would would you agree with the? Oh, certainly. Uh, and of course, Dante are? chooses Virgil as his guide there you go. through hell there you and go. through purgatory. Dante, the, the, of course, wrote in primitive but beautiful Italian. Right, one of the first. He and Francis of Assisi being two of the people that most would we would say would be the first Italian writers. What I was added my fascination was your hint that not only was Virgil uh, could have these Catholic Christian themes. But he's also an Advent character, and I, that's why I wanted you on here. This is our first, our, our second show in Advent. We're in the second week of Advent here. Tell, explain that to our listeners. Virgil provides the bridge, the pagan bridge, in our understanding, and just back to what we were just saying a few minutes ago, between the pagan world and the Christian world by his changing the understanding of who Jupiter is, who God and the fates are, so that Jupiter seems much closer to God, the omnipotent God, directing everything in his providence according to the way that he has designed. Whereas, say, in Homer, Zeus, or, you know, the Greek equivalent of Jupiter, is distinct from fate. Fate seems to control Zeus mm-hmm. in, for, uh, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. But for the uh, Aeneid, it's different. It's as if, in most, most cases, there is some kind of overlap where uh, Virgil goes back to the Greek way, but for the most part, it's Jupiter himself controlling fate, controlling destiny, just the way that we would see God would. And so, as uh, as fate would have it, here along comes Virgil writing the story, and even just before this, in one of his uh, other famous poems, the Eclogues, he speaks of what we call, uh, as Christians, the Messianic Eclogue. He speaks of this uh, this boy who's come to come to bring a golden age of peace. Now, most people have read that as, okay, maybe he's speaking of, uh, of Augustus Caesar here. But it's not a perfect parallel with Augustus Caesar. So ever since the 4th century, Catholics have been reading that, this so-called messianic eclogue, as a, some sort of mysterious prophecy of the unknown, for at least for Virgil, the unknown Savior. It even gets a little ink from Pope Benedict in his Jesus of Nazareth <laughs> infancy volume <laughs> when he speaks about that. It's, just, it's an unknown, the Virgil gives us an unknown key, and it's this Christ uh, himself, who 40 years later comes along and unlocks the mystery of what that boy yeah, is. Can't wow. you remember in our wow. seminary courses, Father Dave, when we when we uh, study what's called fundamental theology, sort of the rational uh, foundations of our of our faith? You would often, when you look to the hints, the classical and the historical hints to the m- Messiah, that would be quoted. Virgil wrote when uh, Virgil Dave? died in 19 B.C. 19 B.C. All right, now. If if so, obviously if somebody said I'd love to I've never I, I want to read Virgil I want to read the Aeneid obviously you'd say well you you got to read Latin obviously ninety nine point nine percent of our people can't read it what's the best English translation I like the uh, the Robert Fagel's one mm-hmm. uh, it's it's somewhat recent Fagel's was a recently deceased uh, professor of comparative languages down at Princeton mm-hmm. and he also did pretty fine translations of the Odyssey and the Iliad as well <laughs> now. Uh, do you allow your students to consult him when they are doing translations? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. We Latin used to Latin only Latin. Remember, we studied Latin. We used to call those ponies. Do you still use those? That term? No. We used to say, "Can we use a pony?" I don't know where that Was came, that but that meant, "Can you go and seek a translation?" Oh. Our professors were pretty good. They said, "I tell you what, I'll let you use a pony if you promise me that first you'll try to work it out and then just check it." Uh-huh. But don't be lazy about On it. On your honor. And he says, I'll be able to detect <laughs> you are. So I want to tell you also, thank you. You do a great job of teaching our seminarians at St. Joseph Seminary in, at Dunwoody here for the Archdiocese of New York, Diocese of Brooklyn, and Diocese of Rockville Center, plus other ones. You're teaching them Latin, is, uh, Latin and Greek. Latin and Greek is in alternating required? years. Uh, they're, uh, Latin is required and Greek is an elective unless you're studying scripture. Uh, and then even in the MA program for the lay people as well, there's a little bit of an overlap. Uh, and then, then if they're going to do scripture for their concentration, they need to do Greek, otherwise for their own edification. <laughs> what, what's your read like of your students at Regis? Uh, where would would you find would they want to take Latin? Are they enchanted by it? Do they feel that it's a waste of time? What's what's your read on it? Well, I think some of them they come from from a couple different uh, vantage points. Some are just it, intrigued by this language that's still around that mm-hmm. nobody speaks or very few. Uh, and they just they're curious about it. It's a little off the beaten track. Uh, others have 
you are into mythology, they've learned a little bit about, uh, there's a popular novel series for children and uh, teenagers called the, the Percy Jackson series. My son has read them. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that it's lots of stuff with Zeus and Poseidon and all that sort of stuff. And they get into it that way. Oh, okay. And sometimes uh, they come to Latin just because they don't want to take any other languages. I'm happy to take those kids, too. <laughs> I'm so proud that you teach it. I'm so proud that our Catholic schools have it. I'm so proud you're at our seminary here in, in New York. i got to tell you one story, then we got to go because we got a lot of great guests, yourself included, today. I, I, I know a, a very high-ranking man here at a very prestigious firm. It happens to be financial management. But he says when he gets, he has to go through a job applications. And when he's going through job applications, if he sees that an applicant has studied Latin, he hires him immediately. Wow. He says, I know I got a serious student. I yeah. know I got a guy who can organize and think well. I know I got a guy who doesn't mind work. So you pass that on to your students. <laughs> can huh? I get this guy's number so he can guess, <laughs> he can guess lecture in my class tomorrow? There you go. You're on. Thank yeah. you, David. Thank Thanks you, Thanks for giving us a new it. insight on Advent. Thanks, Thank Father. you.